called to empower people through transformative preaching, teaching, and organizing, Willie Dwayne Francois III serves as a senior pastor of Mount Zion Baptist Church of Pleasantville, New Jersey, and president of the Black Church Center for Justice and Equality. He is a 2009 Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Morehouse College with a Bachelor of Arts in History and Religion. While at Morehouse, he was named the 2009 Martin Luther King Jr. Scholar. Francois received the Master of Divinity from Harvard University's Divinity School, where he received the Hopkins Shareholders Award, the school's highest academic recognition, and served as the Class of 2012 commencement speaker. In 2020, Francois earned the Doctor of Ministry degree from Emory University, where his research met an intersection of anti-racism, theology, and anti-incarceration policy advocacy. Francois lives at the intersection of the life of the spirit and the life of the mind. His most recent book, published by Brazos Press in August 2022, Silencing White Noise, Six Practices to Overcome Our Inaction on Race, draws on said work as a community organizer and anti-racism educator. He is the co-author of Christian Minister's Manual for the Pulpit and the Public Square for All Denominations, the most progressive and comprehensive clergy resource, and the first interdenominational manual written for Black clergy in 56 years. He has written for the Huffington Post, Religion Dispatchers, Civil Eats, The Hill, and The Christian Century, concerning a range of matters pivoting around race, class, and religion in America. In 2017, Francois was inducted into the Martin Luther King Jr. Board of Preachers at Morehouse College. Francois and his wife, Delijah, are the parents of Willie Dwayne Francois IV. He attributes his love of life and dedication to doing the so-called impossible to his close-knit family. He is a proud member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Praise God, I'm one. Praise God. There is so many things happening in this world. War, diseases of all kind, economic collapse. But God is not surprised by any of this. And although we're waiting on a change to come, I want you to know that God is the same yesterday, today, tomorrow, and forevermore. And he will bring us the change that we're waiting for. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Elmwood, you guys can remain on your seat. You can continue to keep those hands clapping as you help me welcome this generation's most prophetic voices, the Reverend Dr. Willie Francois III. Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be made glad in it. Can we give God glory for God's presence in this place? How powerfully God has moved in our midst. And we don't take for granted opportunities that we have to benefit uh, from the movement of our great God. Anybody excited to be in worship today? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Can we thank God for your pastor? <laughs> pastor Maria is a phenomenal gift. Uh, she is a superlative, superlative talent uh, in, in our work, in our profession. I'm just grateful to call her uh, my sister and to draw breath in the same generation that she draws breath. I'm a big fan of your pastor, uh, and it is an honor, an honor to be here in person to celebrate uh, this very special weekend, this weekend where uh, the world pauses to thank God for a Morehouse man, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> It is, it has been, it has been a part of my life's work uh, to continue that unfinished work uh, that his untimely death left for us to complete and for us to carry on. And so anytime I have this privilege to share uh, in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I do not take that for granted at all. And so thank you, Elm Wood, for allowing your pastor uh, to bring me here uh, to share, I believe, first time I shared was during King weekend uh, in the in the middle of the pandemic and so it's good to be here in person can we thank God for this singing aggregation that has blessed us today what a phenomenal gift they are amen and the way they have led us in worship uh, is is very important for our own formation our own acceptance of of how God is moving in in the world. I'm so grateful to have Dr. Clifton with us today, uh, one of the associate ministers at the Fountain Baptist Church where I am privileged to pastor. Uh, this is my uh, second week on the job. And so I'm grateful, grateful, grateful uh, that Rev is, is here with us today. Although we have a special uh, experience that's happening there in Summit and our, uh, our, my predecessor, uh, our pastor, uh, Pastor Sanders, is preaching this morning. So, so grateful that you're here uh, with us today. But not only that, uh, one of the members of the Mount Zion Church, Sister Blanche uh, Todd, has made her journey uh, here to be with us. And that's a two-hour drive uh, to be in worship. Uh, I imagine she expected to she expected to be with us at Fountain this morning. But when she was in the parking lot and didn't see any cars there, uh, she gave me a ring and I told her how to to get here and so so grateful that you were able to make your way here that trek uh, up the Garden State Parkway I've done it so many times uh, but I want you all to be in prayer for Sister Blanche uh, who has just just funeralized her her husband uh, and she's with us here today so we keep her in prayer as she navigates grief and she continues to live the life uh, that God has called her to live in the life her husband uh, would want her to continue to live Daniel chapter 3 is where we draw our attention for the purposes of preaching today if it's your custom to stand for the reading of the word I invite you to do so Daniel chapter 3 and Pastor has been so kind to uh, help to center and feature uh, my book in our time of sharing and reflection this, this week, that book entitled Silencing White Noise, which we'll have opportunity to, to, to put in your hands after this service uh, in the common area. Um, but in the spirit of that, that, that theme, I draw our attention to the 13th verse of the third chapter of the book of Daniel. 
Some of us will use the aid of screens, Other of us, others of us have electronic devices, and some of us still carry the paper Bible to church. Whatever is your option, we know that they all lead us to this sacred reflection. Daniel 3, 13 reads from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought in. So they brought those men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and you do not worship the golden statue I have set up for you? Now, if you are ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, drum, and the entire musical ensemble, you shall fall down and worship the statue that I have made. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to present a defense to you in this matter. If our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire and out of your hand, O king, let him deliver us. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods and we will not worship the golden statue that you have set up verse 15 now if you are ready when you hear the sound the time is I to share this morning I want to think on the thought resist the noise resist the noise you may take your seats resist the noise thank you for standing in reverence of God's word First published in 1903, The Souls of Black Folk by W.E.B. Du Bois, it explicates that the problem of the 20th century is the problem of the color line. That logic that governs our segregationist politics and tells black people to stay in their place. If you are just semi-woke, I think you will agree that the problem of the 20th century has spilled into the 21st century because there are still policies and practices that are still telling black people to stay in your place. Stay on your side of town. Work on your jobs. Live in your communities. Go to your schools. Spend money in your places. There's still something about the logic of America that is a Addicted and attached to the color line. This Fisk and Harvard trained sociologist unplacks, unpacks the duplicitous consciousness of what it means to be both black and American at the same time. As he's wrestling with that dissonance, that difference, that danger of what it means to live in a country that does not love you but also have nowhere else to go that you can call home, he wrestles with this, what he calls a double consciousness. And what What's powerful about Du Bois' work is that as I read this book many years ago on those red clay hills in Atlanta, Georgia, where men are begotten, I was shaken to my core because of a question that Du Bois raises. Du Bois says that every black person in his time, and I dare say in our time, has a question that it must grapple with, and that question that Du Bois raises is, how does it feel to be a problem? Now, sometimes I talk fast and you might have heard me say, what does it feel like to have problems? Because all of us know what it feels like to have problems from finances to fiancés, from schools to shelters, from, from streets to sanctuaries. We all know what it feels like to have problems, but that's not the question that Du Bois raises. Du Bois raises a more existential, grueling question. He says, what does it feel like to be a problem? Problem with your very nature, your very identity, your very presence, your very voice, your very imagination, your very love, your very essence has been made to be problematic for other people. And I dare ask, is there anyone in here today who's ever been felt to feel? 
to feel like they were a problem. Maybe some of us can raise our hands in affirmation of that same inquiry because we've been limited to, framed as, perceived as, shaped as, or seen as a problem. Though public schools look like prison preparatory academies, America is telling us that we are a problem when prisons look like people like me and not people in Wall Street who bankrupt the country in 08. America is telling us that we are a problem when places like Flint and Jackson and Newark have poisoned water. America is telling us that we are a problem when you have a white nationalist that can occupy the Oval Office or a seat in Congress. America is telling us that we are a problem when you have uh, white high school graduates uh, that make more money than black uh, masters graduates. Uh, America is telling us uh, that we are a problem when you have uh, black children learning two grades below their grade and educators uh, who are underpaid and undersupported. Uh, America is telling us uh, that we are a problem. Is there anybody in here who's ever been made to feel like you are a problem? Ah, but this is what I love about Du Bois, that Du Bois uh, does not stop with the question because uh, he posits his own answer. Uh, and I love the fact that he realized uh, after grappling and wrestling with it long enough uh, that he was not the problem. We are not the problem, but the problem uh, is the sick sabotage system uh, that cannot handle our freedom, cannot handle our joy, cannot handle our love, cannot handle our grace, uh, and cannot handle our power. Uh, and so I've come to this church today to declare if being a problem means loving ourselves, I'd rather be a problem. If being a problem means marching to the drumbeat of God and not the mores of a white supremacist society, I'd rather be a problem. If being a problem means moving according to God's vision for me and not the voices of naysayers and detractors and despoilers, I'd rather be a a problem. I wish there were some folk that came to Elmwood today that can say before I dumb myself down, before I can tort myself to fit into the small boxes that other people have created for me. I'd rather be a problem. I wish there were some holy problems that came to church today uh, that can say, I will not dumb myself down. Uh, I will not be a cheap carbon copy of somebody else's imagination uh, because God created me uh, to live, uh, to breathe, uh, and to die an original. Well, in, in our text... In our text, Pastor, we, 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 we find three problems on, on their feet in a pericope when they should be coerced to their knees. It is this noise that tells them that they're supposed to bow. But I love the fact that when the noise tells them who to worship, when the noise tells them who they are, when the noise tells them that they should bow, when the noise tells them to abdicate their power, they know how to stand up straight in the midst of a world uh, that wants to snatch from them uh, the very dignity that can only be given by God uh, and you better be careful uh, not to allow the power addicted uh, crazed capitalist impulse uh, of this country uh, to strip us uh, of who God has created us to be because you know that your faith uh, has to be noise resistant Am I talking to anybody here today that can thank God for noise-resistant faith? Faith that allows you to reject the noise, turn down the noise, silence the noise, uh, dismiss the noise, change the noise. Uh, because when the world wants to tell you what you can do, what you can't do, who you can be, where you can't be, what you can love, who you can love, uh, you need a noise-resistant faith uh, that allows you to stay on your feet. When everything else wants you to bow. Uh, 
these these first six first six chapters of the book of Daniel are a collection of interrelated narratives about a legendary person of faith Daniel and three of the Hebrews who are in exile in Babylon this narrative offers a window into noise resistant faith under the threat of imperial oppression and punitiveness empires thrive on deflating difference and disinheriting people and Nebuchadnezzar this king of the empire he sacks Jerusalem in 586 BCE he conquers the southern kingdom and it's interesting that in this year that we find ourselves in the text it's three years after he's trafficked 10,000 Hebrews of the priestly and royal families to Babylon as servants and slaves they were ripped from their native land dropped in another people's land and forced to work without wages and forced to build somebody else's power doesn't that sound like our ancestors who were ripped from the western shores of Africa dropped on the eastern shores of the Americas and forced to build a nation and wealth that it would not have access to whenever we think about this week where we celebrate Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. we ought to remind ourselves that we live in a nation that's built on stolen land and stolen labor and if we're going to be who God wants us to be we have to learn how to stand up and turn down the noise am I talking to anybody in here today that can say we are not here to be exploited and subjugated and oppressed and segregated and dismissed because we have noise resistant faith that allow us to speak our truth to live our truth in spite of what this country wants to do to us that's the text that's the text that's how we get here uh, but do you all have a few moments for me to talk about how, what happens when you resist the noise all right here here this when, when you resist the noise, I learned these from these three Hebrew men when you resist the noise you nurture your identity with collaboration I love the fact that all three of these men decided to pose the same form of resistance in spite of the acquiescence of all the other quasi-dignitaries around them. They, they, they nurtured their identity by what they did and how they did it together. In a sea of bent dignitaries, these three heads remain unbowed and, and they remain un, unfazed by uh, the threats of power, by rejecting the noise orchestrated by the king with a fragile ego. Three Hebrew men refused to assent to the roles and ideals narrated for them according to the king's edict this gathering of subjects conquered and appointed were supposed to bow at the sound of the music before the golden obelisk like structure which represented the supremacy of the empire and its leader it was a make America great again symbol it, it was America first America only symbol it was uh, some kind of Trumpism uh, that they refused to bow to ancient authorities tell us uh, that the same year that the obelisk goes up uh, is the year that the temple goes down uh, but here is what's powerful is that these three Hebrew men uh, figure out how to hold on to their identity uh, after three years uh, of miseducation after three years uh, of opportunity stripping after three years uh, of identity denial after three years uh, of being indoctrinated by the empire with their new names they figure out even if they don't have access to the temple that they have become the temple of God in the middle of a foreign place I wish I had time to pause right there because you all know very well when you can't make it to the church you ought to be grateful that God is in you that when you can't make it to the house you ought to be grateful that your God is only one breath away uh, one reach away uh, one smile away uh, one thank you Jesus away uh, is there anybody in here today uh, that can say you can take the church house uh, but you can't take the God out of me uh, because I know who I am the obelisk goes up the temple goes down but instead of bowing they stay on their feet 
I need you to hear this. Because to bow was a sign of forfeiting their identity and their cultural heritage connected to their God story. They changed their names, but they could not change their nature. <laughs> their response to power subverts the authority of the king and the practices of domination. They refuse to bow, which suggests that they live according to an identity that supersedes the imprint of the country and the opinions of their oppressors. We call them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but that's not what their mama called them. That, 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 that's not the names that they got from their grandma and their grandpa. We call them Shadrach, Meshach. Shack uh, and Abednego because that's what Nebuchadnezzar calls them uh, but they knew that their names uh, were Hananiah which means God is gracious uh, Mishael uh, which means who's like my God uh, Azariah uh, which means God keeps me uh, I wish y'all felt what I was saying right there uh, they said my name's not Shadrach uh, which means the moon God uh, my name's not Meshach uh, which means who's like the moon God uh, my name's not a Abednego, which means a servant of the moon god. They say we know our real names. You call me Shadrach. My name is Hananiah. You call me Meshach. My name is Mishael. You call me Abednego, but my name is Azariah because every day I wake up, I look in the mirror and I'm reminded of an ever-living, ever-loving, ever-present, ever-creative God that made me who I I am. Uh, am I talking to the Elmwood Church uh, that can say I don't care what they call me. Uh, I know what I'm going to answer to uh, and I'm not answering to uh, the superficial fabricated uh, domesticating problematic things uh, that other people think I'm supposed to be uh, because I know exactly who I am. Do I have any self-conscious folk in here that can say, I don't care what the noise tries to tell me, uh, what I can do and who I can be uh, and where I can go uh, because I know who I am. Uh, I'm a child of the Most High. Uh, I'm a daughter of the ever-living God of justice. Uh, I'm a son uh, of the liberating abolition fighting God uh, who will not let me go. Uh-huh. C c c c c come here, come here, that you ought to remind yourself that you can reject the noise by telling yourself who you really are. It's not about the names that they put on you and they try to attach to you. You have to keep telling yourself uh, that my mind uh, is too precious uh, for you to walk through it with your dirty feet. Uh, you ought to remind this ever-living world, uh, I mean ever-dying world, uh, that it cannot define you, uh, it cannot box you, uh, it cannot shape you because you know who you are. Now y'all are looking at me like you've never been misnamed. Uh, and mislabeled. Am I the only one that's ever been misnamed and mislabeled because uh, of the color of my skin? Uh, they call us lazy. They call us entitled. Uh, they call us ungrateful. They call us criminals. Uh, they call us uneducated. They call us freeloaders. Uh, they call us welfare queens. Uh, they call us radical. They call us undocumented. Uh, they call us useless. Uh, they call us an element. Uh, they call us weak. Uh, they call us problems. Uh, they call us replaceable. And on and on and on huh? but I'm not answering to what you call me huh? because I know an ever-living God huh? that lives within me somebody ought to shout I'm a child of the most high somebody ought to shout I'm black and I'm proud huh? somebody ought to shout I've been created in the image of God uh, they they refuse to bow because they know the truth about themselves. They, they've nurtured an identity beyond what the world has tried to label them as. Uh, uh, l l l they, they refuse to bow. Uh, I, 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 love, I love Melissa Harris Perry. I used to enjoy on Sundays and Saturdays her show on MSNBC. In fact, one of the reasons why I was so upset that God called me the pastor is because I can no longer watch her on Sunday morning. 
Uh, but, 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 but Melissa Harris Perry wrote a book entitled uh, Sister Citizen, uh, Shame, Stereotypes, and Black Women in America. In this book, she recounts a post-World War II cognitive psychology research project that studied how individuals responded uh, to their environment. Uh, in this study, they people were placed uh, in a crooked room with a crooked chair, uh, with crooked doors and crooked tables and crooked windshields uh, and crooked crooked pictures uh, and they were told to stand up straight. I feel like I got to say that again, that, that people were invited into a room with a crooked chair and a crooked doorway and crooked windshields uh, and crooked fireplaces and crooked pictures and crooked tables. Uh, and they were told to stand up straight. And believe it or not, uh, over a third of the people who were a part of this study, uh, they were bent over 30 degrees uh, because they were ad aligning themselves uh, with the crookedness in the room uh, instead of the straight within them uh, and that's really what these men try to teach us uh, that you better be careful uh, not to align yourself with the crookedness around you uh, but you learn how to stand up straight uh, we have enough bent over preachers uh, and bent over deacons uh, and bent over cops uh, and bent over judges uh, and bent over politicians uh, and bent over lawyers uh, we need some folk who know how to stand up straight uh, in the crooked economy uh, stand up straight uh, in a crooked democracy. Uh, stand up straight uh, in crooked. Uh, am I talking to anybody in here today uh, that can say I'm gonna stand up straight? All right, you nurture, nurture your identity with collaboration, but you also navigate issues with courage. Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. The, 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 these workers in the emperor's employ. They go on strike. They, they, they resist the workplace conditions imposed on them by their imperial boss. Uh, the policy was for them to bow. Uh, and if they did not bow, they would be thrown into uh, the fiery furnace. Uh, that their jobs became an unsafe uh, work environment. Uh, and they say something that's powerful that I believe we have to hold on to. They say, uh, if I got is able to deliver us from the fire, fine. But if not, we still won't bow. That this, this, this. This, 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 the, the, the text preaches alone, Dr. Clifton. The, the text preaches alone because they have a faith uh, that dares to fail. Because, they, you know, you really don't have faith uh, if failure is not an option within your actions. Uh, and there are too many of us who are afraid of failure, uh, which is why we don't know how to practice faith. Uh, if you have failure, faith, fear uh, within you, uh, then you will never live out the faith uh, that God is growing you to live out. Uh, because some of us are only where we are because we risk failure. Uh, some of us have beat the things that have tried. Uh, to swallow us uh, because we risk failure. Uh, some of us have the jobs and, and the careers and the families uh, and the positions we have uh, because we risk failure. Uh, am I talking to anybody in here that can say I do hard things uh, because I'm not afraid to fail uh, because God walks with me uh, and if God is for me I'm taking too long. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm taking too long. I'm taking too long. But it's not faith if failure is not an option. Uh -huh. If you know how it's going to work out, that's called assurance. God never called you to walk by assurance. God called you to walk by faith. That when you have faith, you have to go and you don't know if it's going to work out. You, you have to put in the application. You have no idea if you're going to get the job. You have to apply for school. You have no idea how you're going to afford it. You have to raise the family with no idea where the next check is going to come from. And then your God will remind you when you risk failure, you maximize your faith. Okay. All right. Is it in the text? Uh, here, here, is it in the text? Here, here it is. Uh, the, the, there's some of our translations of this text that sanitize what the Bible says. 
many of us are used to reading this as our God is able to deliver us. But if God doesn't deliver us, we still won't bow. But that's not what the Hebrew says. The Hebrew says, if our God is able to deliver us, let God deliver us. But if God is not able to deliver us, we still won't bow. Now, I know, I know why you hijacked your amens in that point. Because you know God the way I know God. And you know God is able to do all things. I wish somebody in this room would just get excited uh, about the fact that you don't always know if God will do it. Uh, but you know God there. You know there's nothing that God uh, cannot do. Am I talking to myself? Can I get 10 more people in this sanctuary that can say, I know God can do all things. Uh, I've seen God make ways. I've seen God heal bodies. I've seen God destroy enemies. Uh, I've seen God restore families. Uh, I've seen God increase love. Uh, I've seen God open a door uh, that was closed in my face. Uh, I know why you hijacked your amens. Uh, because you know there's nothing too hard uh, for your God. Can I just get 10 people in here that can just lift up your hands, uh, open your mouth, uh, and shout God is able. All right, hear this. But this was about 4,000 years ago. They didn't know God the way you know God, which may means their faith may be more powerful than our faith because they say we don't know if God is able to do it, but we still go with God. Now, you know why that blesses me? Because some of us only love God for God's power, and we haven't learned how to love God for God's presence. Uh, can you love God uh, in spite of what God does uh, and in spite of what God is, uh, but you just love God because God is God? Uh, can you worship God uh, just because God is God? Uh, I'm not talking about worshiping God uh, because of the paycheck uh, and worshiping God because of the breakthrough uh, and worshiping God because of the increase. I want to know some folk that say, I just worship God uh, because God is God. Uh, if I never get another job, I'll still worship. Uh, if I never get the healing I prayed for, I'll still worship. Uh, if I never get the money I need, uh, I'll still worship. Uh, are there any God worshipers in here today uh, that can say, my faith is not transactional. Uh, my faith is transformational uh, because I don't worship God because of what God does. Uh, I worship God uh, because God is God it is. It is. here's what I'm trying to tell you that we fight the way we fight not because it's winnable we fight the way we fight because it's right and we don't do all we do because we know how the election's gonna turn out or how the demonstration's gonna fare or if the writing campaign is gonna lead to the policies we want. We fight the way we fight uh, because if God be God, uh, we have an obligation uh, to stand up straight in a crooked world. I, I, I gotta push, I gotta push. But when you have that noise-resistant faith, uh, it's faith uh, that's rebellious faith. Lord, deliver me from churches uh, who want to be respectable but don't know how to be rebellious. Uh, I, I, I thank God for churches uh, that can say, I don't care what they think about us. Uh, we're going to stand up for our people. Uh, and we're not just going to stand up for our people uh, who wear suits and wear dresses uh, and have St. John's uh, and have tailored suits. Uh, we're going to stand up for our people uh, who have pants that are sagging, uh, who have children that they don't know how to take care of. Uh, we're going to stand up for folk uh, who've been living under violence and oppression uh, and I wish there was somebody in here today uh, that can say you can take your respectability out the door uh, because we've been called uh, to be rebellious uh, against the forces of death uh, and the forces of darkness uh, do I have any rebels in this church today come on where are the rebels where are the rebels where, where, where are the folk that can say I was born to rebel 
Anybody say, I was born to run. I wasn't born to fit in. I wasn't born to get along. I wasn't, a bo- I wasn't born to attract titles. I wasn't born to sit on your committee or be a part of your commission. I wasn't born to follow your cheap rules because you're too afraid to get in trouble. I need some rebels in the house that can say, if I get in trouble, it's going to be some good trouble. Are there any rebels in the house? Come on, are there any rebels in the house? Where, 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 where are the rebels? Where, where, where are the rebels? Huh? These Hebrew men rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar and survived the fiery furnace. Huh? Moses rebelled against Egypt huh? and created an exodus. Huh? Caleb rebelled against the cowardly huh? and liberated his people. Huh? Deborah rebelled against Sisera huh? and liberated Israel huh? because we were born to rebel. Huh? David rebelled against Goliath huh? and brought dignity to his house. Huh? John the Baptist rebelled against the religious elite uh, and paved the way for Jesus. Uh, Mary Magdalene rebelled against the demonic uh, and reimagined discipleship. Uh, We were born to rebel. Uh, Harriet Tubman rebelled against slavery uh, and gave us the Underground Railroad. Uh, Ida B. Wells Barnett rebelled against lynching uh, and lost the first Say Their Name movement. Uh, We were born to rebel. Uh, Stacey Abrams rebelled uh, against Neo Jim Crow policies uh, and gave us a black uh, and a Jewish senator uh, from the deep south of Georgia uh, because we were born to rebel. Uh, Jesus rebelled against the forces of death uh, and gave us eternal life uh, because we were born to rebel. I'm done. When you resist the noise, You nurture your identity through collaboration. When you resist the noise, you navigate issues with courage. But finally, when you resist the noise, you can neutralize intimidation with your continuation. Sometimes you just got to keep on going and prove to them that they are liars when they thought they can control your future. Anybody grateful that you've been able to make liars out of your naysayers? You've been able to make liars out of racists. Uh, Some of us say, I'm a living, breathing witness uh, that racism is a lie uh, and sexism is a lie uh, and xenophobia and homophobia is a lie uh, because I know what God uh, has given me the courage uh, to keep on doing. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, th- this is what the text says. I'm done, Pastor. I-, I know I'm taking too long, but th- this is what the text says. The text says that they carry them to the furnace and they drop them in the furnace uh, and they leave them for dead. Anybody ever been left for dead? Come on, no, I need some folk in here that can say they left me for dead, but I'm still here. Anybody ever been left for dead by folk you loved uh, and folk you helped uh, and folk you raised uh, and folk you increased? Uh, come on, I'm not the only one that's been left for dead. Uh, I've been left for dead by friends, uh, left for dead by partners, uh, left for dead by booze, uh, left for dead by bosses. Uh, but guess what? They didn't know my pulse uh, was greater than their problems. Uh, Because I have a God uh, that'll reach into my fire uh, and give me the power. Okay, Uh, I had more to say right there. But some of us, we know what it means to be left for dead. We've been left for dead uh, by bosses, left for dead by failing schools, left for dead uh, by segregationist politics, left for dead uh, by political parties uh, that use our vote but do not advance our agenda. We've been left for dead uh, by folk uh, who thought they could tear down the Capitol on January 6th uh, because they couldn't get their way uh, because of their entitlement uh, and because of their air of supremacy. uh, But in spite of them leaving us for dead Uh, God knows how to show up and remind us of who we are I'm done y'all but somebody ought to be grateful that they survived the furnace no I I said they threw them in the furnace that's not what the text says the text says they fell into the furnace because the fire that was set for them 
it caught their enemies first. Y'all know that old adage? You better be careful about the grave you dig for me. Because you might want to dig too. Because the one you dig might be for you. Is there anybody in here that's grateful that you have a God uh, that may not show up when you want God, uh, but God will show up. Uh, God may not come when you want God, uh, but you will want God when God comes. Uh, because even when God is late, uh, God is still able to reverse it. Am I looking at some folk that say, I've seen God reverse it. I've seen God turn it around. I've seen God shift it. I've seen God restore it. Are there any beneficiaries in here of a God that are turning around? Okay. All right. I, I'm not, obviously I'm not coming through clearly enough. Uh, uh, we often preach this text and we say God took the heat out the fire. But obviously God didn't take the heat out the fire if the correction officers that took them to the furnace died because of the fire. Obviously God didn't take the heat out the fire. God just made them fireproof. And that's my word for you here today. You are racism proof. You are sexism proof. You are political violence proof. You are hate proof. You are poverty proof. You may have to go through it, but it won't go through you because we serve a God who's able to do exceedingly. I said exceedingly. I said exceedingly. I said exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think uh, will you open your mouth uh, and shout hallelujah for a god that will not fail uh, i said god makes you fireproof i said god makes you fireproof i said god makes you fireproof i'm in my seat but a few years ago about five years ago blanche I had a member at Mount Zion that was low sick. We didn't think she, that's how we say it down south, low sick. We didn't think she was ever coming home. But we went in that hospital room. We laid hands on her. And then two weeks later, she came home walking and talking and giving God the glory. When we were in that hospital room, we didn't know how things were going to work out. But we prayed and left. I got on the elevator. I was in the elevator. There was a woman in a white lab coat. She had on a long black dress. She was wearing some black shoes with the red on the bottom. I don't know what they call those. Uh, maybe she stepped in something. I don't know. L L Louis Vuitton, right? Uh, she, uh, she had a stethoscope around her neck. I said, she must be a doctor. I said, excuse me, ma'am. What do you do here? She says, well, I'm a cardiologist specialist. I say, oh, you're a cardiologist. She said, no, sir. I'm a cardiologist specialist. I said, okay, well, can you tell me what that means? She said, I'll give it to you in layman's terms. I'm the one they call when the cardiologist fails. I said, oh, that's a bad sister. I said, you must have the bag. She said, I do all right. I had on a nice blue suit. I had on a cuff links that were Kappa cuff links. I had a monogram on my shirt because sometimes I forget my initials. I had on some nice brown shoes and a beautiful bow tie. I was looking good. She said, well, what do you do here? I said, well, I don't work here. She said, well, what were you doing here? I said, I came to visit a friend. She said, well, since you were all in my business, can I get in your business? I said, go for it. She says, what do you do for a living? I said, what do I do for a living? Well, let me give it to you in layman's terms. I work for the one they call when you fail. And your God never, ever, 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 ever fail. Will you open your mouth and shout, God never fail.